Okay, so shall I start? Yes, please. Yeah. Okay, so in the last lecture we were discussing that the ground state of a uh, scale invariant field theory of let's say a one plus one dimensional uh, uh, let's say spin chain or a scale invariant theory will have a description in terms of tensor networks in terms of a pattern of this type. Okay. Um, now we could uh, also uh, consider the thermophile double and the thermophile double then would have uh, a description in terms of tensor networks. So here we are imagining that this is the direction x of the field theory. Um, the direction, this is uh, the description of the wave function at a given time, is the wave function at these two times. So t equal to zero on the left and t equal to zero here on the right. So we have the left field theory whose spatial direction is orthogonal to the blackboard and the right field theory whose spatial direction is also orth orthogonal to the blackboard. And um, then we have this um, description in terms of tensor networks. So uh, here this whole structure is the structure of the vacuum of the field theory and the fact that it connects is related to the fact that we are at finite temperature and we have uh, and the degrees of freedom here are entangled with the degrees of freedom on the other side, right? That's the ordinary entangled we have in the thermal state. And we have a particular pattern of entanglement which has to do with the fact that the degrees of freedom on this side are locally entangled with the ones on the other side, okay? We don't have something here entangled with something which is very far away. We have a pattern which uh, is local in space, right? And this is related to the fact that uh, thermal correlators if you were to calculate the thermal two-point function at these two times uh, and you separate the points along the x direction, you will find a, an exponential decay it's related to the thermal masses and so on that are common in thermal field theories, thermal situations. Okay, so that's uh, the situation at uh, this time. It is interesting to uh, contemplate what the situation is at, uh, at bigger times. Um, so we can uh, look at uh, exactly the same setup, but at uh, later times. So we can go to a uh, bigger time here in the boundary theory. So we can look at the wave function, the exactly the same system, but the wave function not at equal to zero, but the wave function at the later time. Right? <laughs> now, we had said that the, uh, so what, what are we doing? Let's imagine we just evolve one of the sides. So we take this state and we just simply evolve this state. So we took the initial state and the particles that make the state will start getting moved by the Hamiltonian. So Hamiltonian will start moving the particles, but it will not move the particles very far away, right? So the amount, the entanglement will spread, but not over very long distances. And if we wanted to make a representation of that, um, of that wave function, well, um, we would need a tensor network roughly of this form. Uh, so it's, this is a tensor network which is, um, which allows you to generate more entanglement. So we, we need to generate some more entanglement between these degrees of freedom and the ones that are further away, right? And one way of doing that uh, is to, um, to introduce more layers of tensors uh, that, uh, so these horizontal lines sort of start generating, then generating entanglement with the neighbors, right? And in this way, this point will be entangled with a bunch of uh, other points which are further uh, distributed, distributed further away. And we expect that the depth of uh, the depth we need is uh, will be of the order of uh, the time that uh, has evolved in units of the temperature, uh, but not not much bigger than this. Um, now, in, in all these cases, uh, so let me go back uh, to the thermal case. Um, if we uh, consider the entanglement between uh, the right-hand side, so we have the two field theories uh, with it, their infinite lines. Um, if we consider the entanglement between the right-hand side and the left-hand side, um, as we had discussed, is given by in the bulk by the Ruta Kayanagi surface, which cuts uh, through the bulk in this way. And in this language, is, uh, would be analogous to, uh, well, it, it is related to separating the system and the maximum 
entropy we could have is just the dimensions of all these links that we are cutting in the tensor network. That's the maximal entropy we can have here. The actual entropy could be smaller depending on what these tensors, the, the values of the tensors are. So, but for most generic tensors, it would be, um, it would be that value. While in this case, uh, because we have more, uh, in this case we have uh, more links, we will have a bigger value for the entanglement entropy. And indeed, if you look at the bulk solution, we have an actual uh, longer line okay, here in the interior. And, um, and therefore, uh, we have, uh, well, he, he, this is a bulk computation, uh, perfectly according to all the rules that we know. And uh, we, um, we find that the length of the surface grows with time. This is a fact I've already mentioned before, that the length uh, of the surface grows with time. And here, um, we, we related this length. So I, I said before that we think that this length is related to the growth of entanglement. Um, and in the tensor network, a growth of entanglement spatially distributed would require us, if we consider tensors which remain of the more or less the same size, it will require us to have a bigger, uh, a bigger region. Of course, you could say, well, I can always represent that by taking this and putting here a big uh, thick line. And by a th thick line, I mean a tensor here, which uh, has lots of indices, a large number of indices. And that is also true. Um, but it seems that uh, it is very tempting here to, uh, <coughs> to think that the growth of these nice slices um, is related to the growth of uh, this tensor network. If we insist that the tensors remain not not very big, they remain simple. So this is this idea that uh, there is some kind of link between the uh, geometries here inside and the representation of the wave function in terms of simple blocks, and that maybe complexity theory has something to do with uh, with this story. So if uh, we make the restriction that uh, we have simple blocks, then uh, we see that as time evolves, we need to generate more longer and longer. Uh, well, we, we need to, to represent the wave functions, we have longer and longer networks. Similarly, if we have these uh, more complicated wormholes that we discussed uh, in the past that are re really have the same amount of total entanglement, but more complex uh, patterns of entanglement will also, uh, will and we try to describe it, since it's a more complex pattern of entanglement, we'll need more and more of these simple blocks to represent it. So, and there is the, uh, so this is all uh, qualitative ideas that uh, fix their description of the phenomenology of the wormholes we, we discussed before. So, um, it's tempting to say that uh, the geometry is encoding the wave function in terms of simple building blocks. The simple building blocks are just uh, empty space or almost empty space with small perturbations, per perhaps some particles uh, living there. Okay. Um, and now here we've uh, used the spatial structure, but uh, one, so let, let me first uh, discuss a simpler case. So imagine that uh, we are only looking at, uh, at what? Well, let, let's consider this again. So here, uh, we said that we, when we evolve forwards in time, uh, we increase the size of the network. Let's now imagine we evolve backwards in time. Then the size of the network would decrease because we go back to the previous state, which needed a smaller network. Um, so we go forwards in time. We could go backwards in time. And then we get to the, so let's say we started at equal to zero, we go forwards in time, and, um, and the size of the ne network gets complicated. We go backwards, we get to the same thing. But now imagine that we insert a bunch of operators here in the future. <coughs> so we evolve this, we insert some operators, which uh, some local small perturbations, and then we evolve backwards in time. Right? Now the state does not need to become simpler, okay, again. Because we did this perturbation and we were all backwards, we don't go back to the original state. 
we get uh, some state which is more, more messed up, let's say. And that's related to those shock waves we discussed uh, when we talked about the warmth of discussion. And so if we perturb the state in this way and then we perturb it again here and we evolve forwards in time, of course, if we don't perturb it here and we evolve forwards in time, then we cancel the backwards evolution here. But here we, uh, we still generate, continue to generate complexity. So we will, if we were to do this, we'll start uh, having to have a bigger and bigger network. So we will have a network roughly of this form where uh, this we have this time evolution. So that corresponds to the stretching of this. At some time, let's say t1, we uh, had, we put in some particular state that uh, changed the tensors we have here. Uh, we are at this level now. And then we continue to evolve uh, backwards. But this increases the complexity of the network. And then we introduce the other uh, the other perturbation here. And again, this is uh, some slightly different link. And now we continue to evolve. And this will continue to generate a more, com more and more complicated. Well, they, they will just continue to increase the length of the network. We cannot shrink the network. So we can only shrink the network when we are undoing something. We are simplifying the state. But we are here. We are complicating it more and more. And we get a longer and longer network. And indeed, that's what we, uh, that's what we said we found with all the shock waves. So we have all the shock waves. And we have some slices here that go through all the shock waves, which uh, roughly mirror this, uh, this going back and forth and this uh, growth of the network. So there seems to be some, uh, some, some rough uh, correspondence, let's say, between the geometry and, uh, and these networks. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the so here you just go forwards in time, right? So, but uh, what I said was uh, that if you look at the surface, uh, at the, let's say a minimal surface that goes through this uh, wormhole, it, um, it, uh, it, it goes up and down, and it has a length here in the interior, which is proportional to t1 minus t2, right? And that, uh, that length is related to, well, it, uh, matches this picture picture of going backwards in time. So this is all uh, qualitative matchings, but it's somewhat surprising. Well, it's somewhat interesting that it works uh, this way. It's nothing to do like introducing the matter and changing the matrix. You live in perturbation and are corresponding to, if you think of gravity and you add matter, there is no gravitation and so it goes back. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, that, that's what we're doing. So we're, we're, so when we send the shock waves, we're introducing a particle and we are sending into the into the black hole. So it and changes the metric. Ah, it changes the metric. Yeah, yeah, the metric changes. So we generate these longer uh, wormholes and so on. Um, yeah, that's, that's what we are doing. Uh, and this, with we are, which we are discussing, discussing with two-sided black holes, can also be discussed with one-sided black holes. It's, it has nothing to do with the two sides. Uh, but um, so there seems to be a relationship between the growth of these slices and the growing complexity of the state. Somehow, these slices are keeping track of the history of how you build the state out of simple blocks. Okay. Um, so that's uh, a little bit the story of the hydrodynamics of entanglement. I don't know what this means. But so this is very vague. Notice that the total entanglement between, um, so let me go back to uh, this picture. So imagine we had a compact system, right? So that is compact in the spatial direction. Then the total entanglement between uh, the top and the bottom, that is to say the total entanglement between the two sides, always remains the same. Always remain, al we always have the same number of vertical lines. Um, and that's just the area of the horizon, which throughout this discussion is not changing. Okay? So even though we're generating more space here, uh, the total entanglement between left and right is not changing. Um, so it's uh, now people sometimes uh, ask, well, you know, this is entangled uh, with the interior, and so okay. So if you look at the bulk, in the bulk you might think, okay, I have this spatial slice, and in the spatial slice, the um, the outside here is entangled with the interior strongly, but not very strongly to the other side. Okay, at least in the context of field theory. Um, 
and um, at least locally. So locally, we don't have these diversions. And here, this entanglement between one side and the interior is just the, the it can be computed by cutting these indices, right? So we have uh, all uh, these indices. But um, <coughs> this whole evolution is just a Hamiltonian unit. It's essentially a picture of the usual Hamiltonian evolution. I mean, this we are making this longer. But this tensor network is just the discretized version of the Hamiltonian, right? So if you look at uh, this, uh, this action, so we have the various uh, block spins. And they're acted on. So this uh, horizontal line represents the nearest neighbor interactions. And then uh, we go one step forward, and so on. So we can think of this as a whole unitary operation. Um, and that, therefore, the total amount of entanglement in the two sides is not changing. Um, it's just that the, this representation keeps track of the history, and that in the gravity description, it seems to uh, track what is uh, going on here in the interior. OK, so all, all of these are pictures, but they seem somewhat suggestive. Now, how to build some theory out of these pictures, I don't know. That's uh, exercise. <laughs> OK, so that uh, finishes this uh, tensor network and uh, sort of complexity discussion we were discussing. So we, so Joe mentioned this uh, story of uh, Hayden and, Pres and um, Harlow, who, who um, who brought up these ideas of complexity and so on. And it might be that, uh, that these ideas of complexity can be put to work by saying that uh, somehow geometry always uh, requires a simple representation of the wave function and so on. And, that, um, and, and that, uh, that's, how we, uh, that's how those ideas are put to work in some more concrete way. Um, <coughs> OK. So, OK, now, um, what else? What is this? Now, I'd like to discuss now one aspect of, um, let, let me, uh, while I finish this discussion of the tensor, tensor networks, let me discuss one. Somehow philosophical aspect of this black hole interior. So we think that the uh, there should be some way. So we have a for on one hand we have the unitary description of the black hole as seen from the outside and, a, and the field theory. The dual field theory gives you a description of this kind, very precise and so on. But the dual field theory doesn't tell you what the interior is. So interior is some bulk conce concept that we need to derive in some way. And um, these uh, various paradoxes, well, the paradoxes that Joe has been describing, are telling you how not to construct the interior. Right? So um, if you think that uh, an operator in the interior um, so the, ma the main point that they showed is that uh, if you want uh, to think about the interior, and especially operators acting on the interior, as operators acting, for example, on the space of microstates, then you run into problem. The space of microstates is not big enough to account for all of this. Uh, if you want to think of them as operators acting on the system the black hole is entangled with, also there are some problems. Um, so we need something, some other construction. Um, and uh, yeah, so we don't know. However, any, uh, there, let me mention one important uh, one important point that I don't know how to make use of it, but uh, I, I feel uh, it's probably important. Is the fact that uh, someone has to measure this operator, okay? And in order for someone to measure this, uh, he has to fall in. So someone has to fall in and do this measurement. And the discussion so far has, uh, most of the discussion people have had about this, uh, I think all of the discussion, uh, has ignored uh, the fact that you, someone has to fall in to do this measurement. Okay? And this paper by Prevoker, right? The paper of Prevoker was actually discussed. OK, sorry, then I missed one. I'm forgetting one of them. But 
OK, so um, now wh why is this relevant? So it, it, it is relevant because uh, the, the wh what whoever does this measurement has to be really complex enough, big enough, carry enough uh, entropy himself or herself to be able to do this measurement. At least, uh, and that, and this guy, in, by the act of falling in, will increase also the entropy of the black hole. And the, um, and now, in terms of the new black hole, this will be a special state. We'll have a special state uh, for, um, for at least for the final black hole, we'll have a special state. And it might be that there is some way of realizing this, which uses in an important way that there is so someone that has to do this measurement. And so things have to only work out for this guy that does the measurement. That they don't need this Hilbert space has to be defined only for him, only for the measurements that he does and not for any other uh, hypothetical measurements he could do, only the ones he actually does. Um, and if you send some, someone very simple, like a spin a half particle, well, this spin a half observer might not be able to measure much. And maybe he gets the answer wrong half the time, but he won't be able to tell. <laughs> uh, he's too simple. Um, but if you send someone really complicated, then she might be able to do the measurement. Okay, very good. So I'd like to discuss now a kind of toy model uh, that seems to have some of these features. So some of the f this, the, these features I'm discussing right now, I, I'm not sure it solves uh, any of the problems, but it's a fun toy model. Um, and this is the following toy model. So you, um, you imagine, imagine the following situation. You have... Um, you have a sphere, a, let's say solid sphere, and you have some particles that uh, can move outside the sphere, but they can never go inside the sphere. Okay? So we have a bunch of particles moving in a potential, which uh, this is the radius of the sphere is one, let's say. So that's, this is not a very spherical sphere. Okay, that's the sphere, radius one. Um, and we have a potential which is infinitely repulsive and is somewhat attractive. So the particles will be attracted uh, near the uh, sphere. And in addition, they will be repelled by uh, some electrostatic uh, potential. So there will be a repulsive potential between all these charges. <coughs> okay, so we'll have a bunch of charges and particles. And uh, they will repel each other and so on. So in, at finite temperature, there will be uh, located here at the bottom of this potential. Uh, we can choose this potential to be very deep so that most particles are very near the bottom. And, um, and so on. So this is basically a conductor. Okay? So we have a bunch of charges and they lie mostly on the surface of the sphere. So they are repelling each other. It's just an ordinary conductor. It's a little toy model for a conductor. Okay? Now let's see what happens if you um, <coughs> If you put in uh, some big charge here, Q, okay, you have n you now bring an external, uh, let's say, some big charge or some charge here, Q. Then uh, these other charges will rearrange themselves, and it will look as if there was a mirror charge, some charge here minus Q, in the interior of the sphere, right? But there is no actual charge in the interior of the sphere, right? There is uh, um, it's just the collective motion of all these charges. Um, okay, so what, what does the dynamic look, look in this uh, situation? So the, there is a charge that uh, goes into the interior of the sphere, and then there is, uh, there is a mirror charge that is approaching the sphere. So as time, this is time, and this is the radial direction. So we have some motion which uh, roughly has this form. So as time progresses, the charge comes in, and the mirror charge comes from the other side. Now this diagram for the motion looks uh, very similar to the, the same diagram that we would have if we drew the trajectory of the particle in Schwarzschild coordinates. So we have r and time, and the trajectory of a particle in, uh, of an ordinary particle in those coordinates is such that uh, it's basically of this form. So this, this is a particle falling into a black hole, could be this particle. So this is a particle falling into a black hole has this type of uh, trajectory. So as, 
r goes to 1, time goes to infinity. That's just the fact that it takes an infinite amount of time to fall into the black hole. But then if you take the Schwarzschild coordinate in the interior, just the ordinary coordinate that appears in the metric, that coordinate uh, goes from minus infinity, and then it starts going down as you, uh, as you go in. Okay. So it is, uh, it is tempting to say that, well, maybe, s maybe the interior is constructed in some way like this, where um, the interior is not really some separate Hilbert space or anything, but it represents some kind of collective excitations um, in the of this system. Okay. Now, does this solve uh, the paradoxes posi posed by amps and so on? Um, I mean, it, it seems to be a kind of complementarity because you, uh, indeed, the mirror charge is some kind of collective excitation here. Yes? Why does it take the charge to an infinite time in this model to reach the... No, I, I didn't say. I said it was just similar. No, it doesn't. In this model, it doesn't take an infinite time. Then and it's well, it You, 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 yeah, uh, you you can you you can um, you can modify this model a little bit, uh, and then it, it would take an infinite infinite amount of time. So you can change the kinetic term for the Lagrangian for these actions in such a way that they effectively move in hyperbolic space. You can make this essentially like a hyperbolic space. But I, I I'm not sure it is. Uh, so you 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 can make it be infinite, but it's uh, not a big deal. So the the important part here is not that it is infinite because in the end. Even in this kind of motion, you cannot resolve distances very close to R. So at some point, you uh, reach the Planck scale. So it doesn't matter after a while. Uh, so and so I, I will not. Uh, it's not an important distinction. Um, um, the of course, this would be saying that the what is uh, forwards in time psychologically for this person falling in. It's actually backwards in time from the point of view of the objective observer who is uh, outside. Okay. Uh, now, question. Does this uh, really solve uh, the AMPS uh, paradox and so on? And the, the right answer is that it doesn't solve the AMPS paradox in the for, for, for what they uh, were originally formulating it. And because this model obeys all the assumptions uh, of the I mean, th this system obeys all the assumptions that they had. So there is some system here and so on. And in this system, you would not have that very elementary charges, very small fluctuations, are really entangled with some mirror. So uh, in, in, the, in the case that uh, they set it up, you would uh, have a firewall in the sense that they discussed. But that's this uh, for these elementary particles. However, um, the observers that fall into black holes are not these uh, very basic objects, but are some more complicated ones, which have a big free energy. So they have a big uh, value of uh, the energy over t, right? Big value of uh, what we were calling k in the first lecture. And, um, and re recall that uh, the entropy that these observers uh, will carry and if they have a memory register that uh, is going to do some measurement and it's going to do something, this memory register will have many uh, possible states. Um, and so the, num but the number of states will always be, uh, well, will be something that is related. So the am total amount of measurements is related to the possible entropy of that memory register. Um, but their energy has to be bigger. That's the Bekenstein bound. Okay? And this is the... Um, uh, this is the same quantity that appears in the free energy for how probable or unprobable this uh, excitation is. And so the excitations that are, can really be correlated are excitations which, uh, whose energy cost in uncorrelated them, uncorrelating them is very small. Right? I mean, it's, sorry, the energy cost is very large, or the free energy cost is very large. Those are the ones that will be very tightly correlated. And so if we have this uh, external... Um, observer who is going to do a complicated measurement, it will have a large uh, free energy. So it could definitely be correlated with uh, something inside. Um, and so the question is whether uh, it is possible in some way to uh, reproduce this and to, <coughs> well, this is just an idea. It's not, uh, uh, it's not a con concrete construction. It says as a very 
simple toy model. I mean, this is just a charge. It's not, uh, it's not a very complicated observer which uh, reproduces a full effective field here. Um, right. So, but uh, I, think, I think this little toy model says that we should be open to considering somewhat uh, strange situations like this one where uh, the, the fact that the observer does the measurement and that we only need to reproduce effective field theory as measured by an observer not some pre-existing field theory measured by an idealized observer. So, um, so in the whole, most of the discussion involves measurements by idealized observers who do not uh, affect the system. And it might be that uh, we really need to uh, include it in an important way. And this is a simple to example where including it in an important way seems important. <coughs> okay, that's uh, basically all I... Yes. Question. Yes. The end sounds a bit like the way uh, Samir talked about what happens when you fall into a puzzle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this this look, this this looks very similar to what the, he's calling. Uh, maybe it's identical to what he's calling um, fastball complementarity. Though the, though I I feel um, yeah. So it's a complementarity only if you wish for the uh, big observer who's doing some measurement. Except that I, I'm not sure it is the same because he, he wants to say that if that observer actually measures something, some, some Hawking mode, he will see it uh, uncorrelated. While I want to say that if this observer actually goes and tries to measure the Hawking mode, he will see them correlated. Um, but well, it's not a big difference. So it's basically a toy model, if you wish, for fastball complementarity. Um, I'd like to, to say one word about fastballs because I, I feel that there is a... Uh, well, now that you mentioned, there's just one little comment. So we already know, in some sense, what the fastball is. So the, we have uh, we have the, um, and I think that the fastballs that have been discussed are no better than the one I'm going to discuss right now. Um, so we have the horizon, and we have all the all the uh, thermal fluctuations outside the horizon, right? So we have the the state here of all the we have all the Rindler modes outside the black hole, and they are in a thermal state. We have all these various states, and presumably different microstates will have uh, perhaps different values for these states and so on. Um, and so uh, a little, if you wish, a toy model for a fastball, or uh, any fastball should reproduce this, is just to think that the, fa the fastball microstates are all the microstates in Rindler space, and, and, and that's it. So. So imagine the fastball being simply that we have only the states outside the black hole and nothing else, up to, let's say, L Planck, so as to get the black hole entropy correctly. Of course, this uh, will not reproduce the numerical factor, but let's imagine that by some miracle we reproduce the numerical factor. This will uh, give us, uh, for us, uh, well, both the microscopic degrees of freedom, and in the fastball picture is basically the same picture, except that instead of little, uh, instead of, uh, modes of fields and so on. We have uh, calusa klein monopoles and complicated things. But conceptually, it would be a picture very similar to what I'm, uh, w what I'm saying here, with no interior. Okay. Um, so and then in this, so then the interior could arise uh, through a mirror construction of this kind. Have we ever seen something like this? So, do we have something that looks Vaguely like this, I would like to ask. Um, so, uh, something something vaguely like this is the following. So, um, imagine that you have uh, the the thermal gauge theory, um, and you have uh, the two sides in an entangled state, right? So then uh, we. Uh, we, know, we, we always discuss the sum over states en, en, right, that we, we discussed a million times. Now, the states that we are entangling here are gauge invariant, right? Now, let me, for a second, uh, assume that uh, we work in the bigger Hilbert space. We now have a bigger Hilbert space of, of gauge non-invariant states. So then, uh, um, we could imagine uh, building a state where we have state n and with uh, 
with some uh, charges, some representation R, let's say representation R, and with index I within the representation. And they will be entangled, of course, with this state in representation R and the corresponding index. And now we sum over all the states and the representations and the indices in the representation. Right? Now, if we did this, then this would be the wrong answer. Okay? This uh, would give us the wrong answer because we are entangling things which are not gauge invariant and we are considering non gauge invariant states. Give the wrong answer to what question? Uh, to the thermophile double of the. Th this is just purely field theory. So the, to the thermophile double state, is not, this is not the right state. What geometry do you think a terrible state would give? Uh, I'll get that to that in a second. So then uh, let's first build the, the correct state. So the correct state is supposed to have some matrix U here. Which uh, uh, so that's the matrix, uh, the, the, the matrix in the group. So one way to build the correct state is to add the matrix U here and integrate over all possible matrices. And then uh, if the representation is non-trivial, that integral will just give us zero. And the only states that will survive this sum <coughs> will be the original states. Okay. Um, very good. Now imagine that uh, this integral had a saddle point, had a saddle point uh, contribution. So that the mat this integral uh, will, will yeah. this is common in thermal field theories, that this integral has some saddle point u0, some particular matrix u0. Um, and then, uh, then the state now will look like, well, we'll have this matrix. So, so let's just, for the sake of the argument, say that the uh, this uh, matrix U0 is just the identity. So then we have the original state and the, we have this entanglement <coughs> between the two sides. Um, or if it is uh, non true. So what the analogy I would like to make is to say that um, the, uh, each of the sides, uh, when, we consider, when we consider the full geometry, is similar to these non-gauge uh, invariant states. Um, because we are not imposing the constraints of GR on this surface. We are, we, we, we are imposing the constraints on GR on this type of surfaces. And that the role of the interior is uh, similar to the role played by the matrix U. It's just imposing that these two sides really decouple. That when we do the integral over U, just we have a, an actual decoupling between the two sides. Um, um, OK, so that's, uh, again, some big idea and th this well th this 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 feature is a feature of uh, also if, if we were to consider the thermal partition function so th what i'm going to discuss now is a more uh, well um, well studied uh, situation which is um, if you consider the thermal partition function for the gauge theory you can represent it as an integral du of uh, the thermal partition function without imposing the gauge constraint so this is some c of u right um, which uh, includes the sum over all representations in the, in the, in the gauge theory of uh, you know, trace representation R of U and then the partition function in representation R of the, of the gauge theory. Okay? And what this integral does is it, uh, it removes uh, all the... Uh, but notice that uh, so in, in many situations this integral has a saddle point. And in fact, if we are in the... We're in the deconfined phase, it will have a saddle point. That's the signature of the being in the deconfined phase. This is a well-known thing that we can approximate this integral by some saddle point uh, contribution, right? Yes? And if we naively look at the saddle point contribution, it looks like we, all, we, we do have all the other representations. So we do seem to have more states than uh, we initially uh, were considering. Um, and so what is... Uh, and, and also we have this uh, matrix U. So what is the physical meaning of this matrix U? I mean, the matrix U started out as a Lagrange multiplier. Doesn't, uh, I mean, it's integrated out, doesn't uh, have any. But um, so this matrix U will be, uh, will be useful for calculating all the correlation functions of, uh, of Wilson loops. So if we now add a Wilson loop in representation R, we can, uh, the fact that this has a, saddle point value tells us that there is a simple formula 
for the Wilson loop in representation R, which is just the, the classical formula in terms of this classical solution. Okay. Um, okay. So I, I mean, wh why why are we saying all this? So well, we we, we know that uh, in the gravity description, this uh, uh, this whole story has to do with what's going on here at the tip of the cigar. So also this Wilson loop loop expectation bothers are non-trivial because we can have strings that go around the tip of the cigar. Right? And so it seems to be that this saddle point, this fact that the saddle, there is a saddle point for u0 is related to the fact that the, the cigar can have a non, that, that, the, that it is a cigar and not a cylinder, that things can shrink smoothly here. And of course, uh, the fact that this can shrink smoothly is related to the fact that the Lorentzian geometry uh, has this has is smooth and then has some interior and so on. Um, and I wanted to emphasize the, the fact that the whole dependence, so this has some dependence, so we, we got to this minimum. So why did this have a minimum, right? So this had a minimum because of the non, so the, this has a non-trivial dependence on u0 because, um, because of the non-trivial representations. So it had the non-trivial, the, the fact that it had a minimum came from the unphysical part of the, from the representations that we don't care about, right? Um, so, um, so this classical thing, so th th this classical U0 uh, is telling us about perturbations of the state, not the state itself, right? So uh, of course, the, when we evaluate the saddle point at the minimum, yeah, it tells us the free energy at the minimum. But it's telling us information about perturbations we can do on this state. So n exploring the neighborhood of this state, adding these Wilson loop uh, operators and so on. So it, it, it appears that the, uh, something similar is happening here. Uh, I'm not sure, I'm, I'm not want to say, I don't want to say necessarily that uh, the interior is the gravity dual of that matrix, though I'm tempted, but I don't want <laughs> to say. Um, um, but it might be that uh, an analogous thing here is happening not for the uh, gauge group or to, for UN, but for the group of uh, constraints of general relativity. That, um, yeah. Okay, so those are where vague, some vague ideas. And um, other qu comments or questions? You would see some correspondence between the non-gauge invariant state on the boundary and the non-Willard de Witt solutions in the boundary. No, no, I don't. I don't want to say that. No, I, w I would like to say that. So here, th this, uh, in this, the so here, u zero. I'm making an analogy similar to the interior, right? And this contains information about the formations we can do of the theory, adding these Wilson loops. What are the deformations we can do here of the interior? Well, sending someone in. Okay, so we are deforming uh, the the state in some way. We're sending someone in, and um, the interior has the, the information of how, uh, well, how to compute those expectation values and so on uh, for, for, sending a, for being able to absorb the person that, uh, that falls in. Uh, it's a deformation. It's not, it's not contained in the... Notice that the state that contains the person falling in is not in the Hilbert space of microstates of the original black hole. It's in, a, in, the, in the one of the bigger black hole. Right? We have to increase the size of the black hole in order to absorb the person. Um, but so that's uh, analogous. So all of these are analogies. I apologize for the imprecision, but hopefully it will be inspiring to some of you. At least you'll think of something much better. Um, well, or something good, at least. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you say the interior is like that because if you take a slice above it, it you, you, you don't Yeah, you also have the three regions. You have the outside, let's say, you have the U, and then you have the inside. Yeah, and you have the other side, for example. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I'm not sure how much I want to continue. Do, do you want more speculations or something more? <laughs> <concrete>? <laughs> <laughs> maybe I'll, I'll continue with some more speculations because 
I feel s some people were complaining there was not enough string theory in this. And thi this will not be string theory, but uh, it's the question of whether maybe the fact that there are strings might be helpful. And, and in fact, dbrains were useful for understanding ADS-CFT, even though maybe in the end you could say, oh, we didn't need them, but you actually needed them to actually, uh, uh, to actually find it. So, um, so one thing is, wh what is a horizon? What does a horizon look like in string theory, right? And well, we we discussed uh, at infinitum the fact that we have all these closed string excitations, which are these Hawking modes that uh, live outside. Uh, but in string theory, there is a new kind of excitation that we can have. This is a discussion that was discussed by Lenny many years ago, but I'm just uh, mentioning it. Um, there is a new uh, type of excitation, which are strings that come out of the horizon. So we can have a string that is uh, here on the horizon, and it's, it's a little tip. Let's say we can think of, for example, a folded <laughs> string with the tip coming out and then going back in. Right? And these are uh, new type of excitations that uh, we can have. And what is the, do we have a picture in the gauge gravity duality for these various excitations? So the picture would roughly be like this. Um, so we have the space on which the gluons live. So we have all the thermal gluons that are, are moving around. And recall that at strong coupling, these thermal gluons want to fractionate very much. They want to divide into lo lots of lots and lo lots of little pieces. Right? Very good. Now what is uh, a closed string that is far from the horizon or far away from the horizon? Well, those would be a pair of gluons which are relative, so let's say the, the thermal distance is beta, it's this distance. So those would be uh, some gluons which are very close to each other and in a color neutral state. All the colors are contracted this way. And so that would be uh, this pair of gluons. But in addition, of course, we have all the background gluons. So we have all the gluons forming the thermal state. And these are not, uh, th cor the colors are not correlated in a simple pairwise fa local fashion like this. The, the colors are correlated in a complicated way, all of this and so on, and uh, so it's, it's in a rather complicated state. And if you wish, the, the bulk, the entropy is mainly coming from all these uh, gluons that have essentially to lead in order uncorrelated uh, colors. Right? Now, your, your temperature is above the deconfinement. Oh yeah, yes, yes, yes. I'm also I'm discussing the case where there is a black hole. Right? So we are. Yeah, the temperature is, uh, yeah, we're in the conformal theory, so the temperature is uh, finite, or, yeah. yeah. We're in the deconfined phase, we have this situation. So these strings coming out uh, would correspond to a situation where in this complicated chain of gluons, there are two that are somewhat close to each other, right? Um, and then, so that's somehow the tip of the string that came, uh, comes out. So we can come out very close to the boundary, so that would be a situation where we have these two gluons very close to each other. Um, and then the rest, of the, the the rest of the colors of these gluons, they are not connected to each other. So this is one of the color lines, and then there is the anti-color line and so on. It's, uh, that one is diluted in the background. So that's uh, completely diluted in the background. And that's the string ending here on the boundary. Um, and uh, if you think about the entropy of the black hole, so normally the qualitative way to think about the entropy is to say that we have a gas of gluons with n squared, um, with a factor of n squared that comes from the just the indices which are uncorrelated. And um, so that suggests that this, uh, okay, good. And here we have these strings that are ending on the horizon. And when we have an, a string ending on the horizon, there is an extra entropy uh, coming to these states that uh, has a factor of, uh, of uh, 1 over g, okay? Um, and there are two ends, so we have, um, yeah, so maybe I, so there's a factor in the entanglement entropy for on each string wall sheet, which goes like logarithm of g. Um, this comes uh, about by, well, maybe. I'm so if you look at the entropy on the string wall sheet, it's, it's completely divergent, but the string, I mean, it's just divergent. But the string is a theory of quantum gravity, and uh, the two-dimensional quantum gravity theory has an Einstein action, which contains a log g times so log um, log g. This is just phi, 
times the square root of gr. This is a two-dimensional curvature. So that's simply the usual Bekenstein formula for the, for the entropy. Um, so that's uh, the contribution from each of the strings, each of the string tips. And we have a factor of two because we have two tips. Um, wh what's the question? And there is a minus sign because we are weak coupling with the positive. And if you now exponentiate this, you get the black hole entropy, so e to the uh, e to the this. That's uh, e to the when you consider the multi-particle contribution. There's a qualitative way to get the black hole entropy, and a problem for for you perhaps uh, uh, is to get this to work precisely because I think uh, this is uh, an old idea that uh, hasn't been uh, precisely made to work. Uh, and it looks like it should be trivial because, uh, well, we know, we know the final answer. Um, and uh, people have discussed it, but it's not, uh, I think, derived in a convincing way where you can really see the origin of, uh, of the black hole entropy with a finite, uh, finite coefficient very precisely. Now, wh why am I saying this? So uh, I'm saying this because, well, this is an old idea. This is, uh, was discussed by uh, Saskin and Uglum. Um, I think that uh, with the picture of the gauge theory, we can see a little more precisely where the different pieces here come in. And indeed, it, it seems that it's, it's in the right, uh, this idea is in the right neighborhood, because it really is uh, considering the various gluons and, and, and so on. Um, OK, so um, now when we are at the, uh, yeah. That side, I see, you get, I, I, you left that uh, there's a factor of the area. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, the area, because we can be at any point. Uh, on that side, on that yeah, side. I, w I was only trying to get the factor of 1 over g squared. So the fact that uh, we get the factor of 1 over g squared. Oh, the area is just all the, the, these gluons can be anywhere in, in space. And so that's the factor of the, I mean, that's just the usual. So there is the volume of the space, right, times uh, beta to uh, the, well, in this case, it's a three-dimensional volume divided by beta cube. That's equal to the entropy, right? This is the calculation in the conformal field theory. I was focusing throughout this discussion only on the dependence on the string coupling, right? Um, people also discuss this in the following. So in the, that same paper we were discussing is if we look at the Euclidean black hole and we look at the contribution of these closed strings, we get uh, we can only get a thermal contribution from a diagram that goes around the, uh, the circle, so a one-loop diagram. But something interesting happens with these uh, strings with tips because we can, this is the tip of the string, and the tip of the string yeah, really goes around the thermal circle. Um, but the rest of the string can wrap around the Euclidean <coughs> cigar, right? So that the whole surface looks like you take the sphere, you flatten it into a pancake, and then you wrap it around the cigar. So this is a sphere diagram, and that's why we get the 1 over uh, g squared uh, term in the action. Um, so that's a qualitative uh, discussion, but it would be nice to make it a little more quantitative and relate it to an actual uh, microscopic, well, an actual statistical calculation uh, based on, on these little tips. No. And I think having a more, let's say, bulk, even at this level of string theory, in, uh, discussion of the entropy might be useful for uh, then understanding the various other, uh, the, the various problems we've been discussing. Um, and, um, okay. So when the, when the string, when alpha prime is very large, so when alpha prime, sorry, is very small, um, so then these tips cannot make it very far away. They are very close to the horizon. That's the very strongly coupled region that we normally consider. Mm -hmm. and there it really looks like, so what, what are these, uh, these strings? If, if you look at, um, at what these charges are, are seen, is that they, can, they can get pretty large, and nothing, nothing much happens to it. Or if someone travels through here, they don't see anything. They only see these little closed strings. They, it is as if uh, there is a little ball around each point where uh, you can have these color neutral states and they w nothing interferes with them. But once these little tips get to, the, to this radius, they mm -hmm. fall in and somehow suddenly disappear. In the stringy case, there are some more fluctuations and this surface is a little more fuzzy. 
So there is no, no clear uh, radius. Where um, OK. There, there is actually a fun thing. There is a fun, a fun problem that one could consider, which is imagine that you, you do the inverse from what I w we were saying right now. You imagine sending a string, a folded string, that um, is sitting. You, we have, uh, let's say, for example, a Wilson line in the adjoint here. And you send a folded string tip that uh, goes in and out, right? And so let me draw it in space time. So you, the, the, folded, the tip of the string can go in, it loses all its energy, and then goes out. So this is the trajectory of the tip of the string. This is the full string surface. And then um, if you send it in with more energy, it will go in a little more. And if you send it in with more energy, it just goes in and just disappears behind the horizon. And there's a really sharp transition here when uh, it disappears behind the horizon. So it's a real critical energy that it has a little more energy than that. It just uh, disappears behind the horizon. What's the, big, the gauge theory picture of that? So the gauge theory picture of that is uh, you have, so this is a point where the Wilson line is extended in time. And we are sending in a little puff of, uh, um, so we are sending, we are, we are having an excitation which expands out and then comes back in, right? Spans out a little more and comes back in. And if it doesn't have much energy, it doesn't see much. It just manages to come back in. But if it goes out enough, it suddenly gets stuck. It gets stuck with all these other gluons that are moving around, and that's uh, falling uh, behind the horizon. And there, what is the picture? So the picture is that these uh, two separate tips of the string, so the string reached this point, and now it, all the colors are, the, it became, uh, so this tip of the string can be viewed as a, as a gluon that is coming out uh, in a spherical wave out of the Wilson line. Right? So yeah, the gluon. Some kind of large M tensor or something? Uh, yeah, yeah. So here we have a, this, this is a, yeah, indeed a phase transition for the behavior of this little probe. Um, <coughs> it's not very different than the phase transition you have when you have the quark anti quark potential. And when you separate by big, bigger than a certain amount, it, uh, the string gets di disconnected. Uh, in the, and the string starts falling to the horizon rather than to each other. Like but the, 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 the advantage of, yeah. So the advantage of consider this one is that we can probe distances very close to the horizon and as close to the horizon as we, as we want. Um, so this is a gluon that is coming out of this center and it's exploring what, what it sees. And what it sees is that its color is never correlate, uh, well, it, it, it preserves its, its identity. But if it goes out uh, further than a critical radius, then it, uh, then it somehow starts interacting with the bath and, uh, and gets completely decorrelated. Um, now, why am I saying all of this? Uh, well, first of all, it has to do with strings. Um, it's a part of uh, what happens around black holes. Um, uh, but it has something to do with, uh, it, it might be a more uh, concrete realization of this conductor model I, I started discussing some time before. After all, this is like a color conductor here. Uh, so it might be that um, we can view the rest of the plasma as some kind of uh, color conductor and that uh, this polarization uh, story that we had with the mirror charges and so on is actually realized in, in some way in the non-abelian gauge theory. Um, okay, I, uh, that's uh, an hour so far. Yeah. What? I have half an extra half hour. Just for another fifteen minutes. Oh, only fifteen minutes. You can, you can, you can take half an hour. Oh, I thought I started four twenty, but well, I. Yeah. Uh, Hawking radiation. So Hawking radiation is just the creation of a of a closed string, right? So, so off yeah, it's a closed string that is coming out of here and it's going out, right? So far, I haven't said anything new. So here, uh, so in general, so if we if we look at the gluon, so if we look at the sum region, so the the, the gluons in this region are all co color correlated with gluons that are outside, right? Mm -hmm. And these color correlations prevent them from becoming small. Okay, so something they, they want to become small, but these strings, let's say these color forces, push them and keep them in this very uniform fluid. So the strongly coupled fluid is very very uniform, 
And that's well a picture that uh, what people have already discussed. And but now, uh, let's say by chance, there are two that, uh, that uh, are color neutral. And so these two that are color neutral then can become smaller and can, uh, I mean, that's the Hawking radiation. So they become smaller and they could be as small as you want and they could interact with the local operator and, and go out. So it's like having red resources, you, you, you generate kind of singlets there? Yeah, yeah. That's right. You generate a singlet, and so these singlets are the things that can make it out. The non-singlets are the strings that uh, remain stuck to the horizon. And, and if a string tip can move out and these two can combine, then uh, that's the same as uh, this picture. So we have two gluons that are getting close to each other, and there are these, uh, these are the rest of the strings that go all the way to the horizon. If they somehow can combine with each other, then yeah, all of these are pictures. I, I don't know how to get them into. Th there is a fun calculation. One can do some in planar diagrams and these tips, which uh, also shows this transition at weak coupling. But um, um, yeah, we, we don't have a Hamiltonian version for this uh, planar sum for the restriction to planar diagrams, so it's not so useful for learning, uh, for, for getting a toy model. I mean, we probably would make a lot of progress by having a really a solvable toy model of a black hole. So a black hole, Lorentzian black hole, where we can solve it and is, let's say, doesn't interact so strongly that uh, we cannot solve it, but, uh, but, but strongly enough that we have a black hole or have some of the features of black holes, like... Uh, of the model of the gauge theory. Yeah, of the gauge theory. So, I mean, the, the nicest, the, perhaps the best candidate is the C equal to one matrix model. Um, in the non-singlet singlet sector. Unfortunately, it is solvable in the singlet sector, and there there are no black holes or nothing that behaves like black holes that has been recognized so far. And all attempts, many people attempted to find black holes there, and they, we, all of us who attempted failed, but maybe some of you might not fail. Um, but the best candidate is to think about the non-singlet sector, and unfortunately, the non-singlet sector is not uh, as solvable as uh, one would wish, but it feels that it should probably be solvable. So the, that matrix model involves uh, a matrix with a, an inverted harmonic oscillator potential. If you had a, a, an oscillator poten harmonic oscillator potential which is uh, of this kind, then the model would be solvable even in the non-singlet sector. Uh, we know that for sure. But this other one, since it's not too different, one would think that it should also be solvable. But so far, attempts at uh, at solving it in the regime that w would be important for finding the black holes has not been uh, have not been successful. Um, so these uh, non-singlets would give you strings in the dual. Th they would give you strings in the dual picture, which are similar to this that come into the horizon and go out. And so on. Um, okay. So, any other questions? Okay. So in the last half hour, I, I'm going to also um, discuss something completely different. Um, it's a little more concrete, but maybe equally speculative. Uh, <laughs> and this is a question of, um, this is the following question, so which is often asked. So we, we know that cosmology uh, <laughs> generates a highly entangled state, uh, right? So we have inflation. Um, is there a question? No. So we, we, we have inflation. And uh, so this is inflation. And then we have the big bang phase. And so here we can start with two, uh, two regions, which uh, these are commoving distances, x. So two regions which whose proper distance is very small. And then they expand exponentially. We create some fluctuations. And now we then go and look at the sky and see the fluctuations uh, that uh, we have in the sky. And these fluctuations start out as quantum fluctuations. And so what we are measuring is really uh, correlations across the sky for things which originated as quantum fluctuations. Now, question number one, uh, one would like to ask is, can we prove that they are quantum fluctuations? Can we prove that are quantum? Well, how, how do you prove this? So, well, you can do computations using the hypothesis that they, they are quantum. 
and then test uh, those hypotheses, right? And well, what calculations have been done? Well, the two-point function, um, maybe three-point function you can measure and so on. So you can do some measurements, some observations. Um, and, uh, and well, you can, uh, you, you can in that way uh, try to test that they are quantum. This is similar to testing quantum mechanics by computing the spectra of atoms, right? So you have quantum mechanics, you do calculations, you find the atomic spectra, you really uh, find that they agree, agrees with the experiment, and then you are very impressed, you, you can declare vector. But then someone would say, well, no, this is not really a test of quantum mechanics or the weirdness of quantum mechanics. You really need to test something really weird, you know, test uh, <laughs> entanglement, test something strange. Uh, and then uh, Bell <coughs> came up with this idea of uh, testing uh, the, the Bell inequality. So you take uh, the Bell inequality, and then that's a real test that convinces you that, you know, you cannot, uh, you, you cannot, you cannot reproduce quantum mechanics using a, a theory of uh, hidden variables which respects special relativity. Um, so there is something interesting and new going on. Could we, so could we have a Bell inequality test uh, in cosmology? Could we have some, something that uh, would, would really work? Okay, so the question is can we have a test, uh, at least in principle, a test of uh, quantum mechanics uh, similar to Bell inequality. Well, a briefly, a little crash uh, reminder of uh, Bell inequalities. So what is Bell inequality? So we have uh, a simple, let's say, spin system, uh, which, and here we can measure um, two non-commuting operators, A or A prime, or B on B prime, whose eigenvalues are plus or minus one. So we measure very simple things, whose eigenvalues are plus or minus one. And um, then uh, we, uh, we compute certain correlators between them. Uh, well I hope I remember correctly the combination that we need to take. Uh, if not, some of you can help me. Okay, so we form this combination. Let's call this C. Let's hope that this one works. So let's see uh, what results we would get um, if we were. Um, let me see. Let me see. I have the right combination. Um, Okay, well, there is some combination. I probably not remember it correctly. But if you, um, it is such that uh, it's, its maximum value when uh, you have local hidden variables is two, and the expect quantum mechanical expectation value could be two square root of two. Um, I'm unfortunately, I, sorry, I'm, I apologize, I, I didn't. Uh, well, let, let's try this one. So here, if, uh, a, for example, is one, um, then B and B prime could be at most, uh, so this could be at most two. And this should be designed in such a way that if A, um, so this is at most two, but this, wh whatever we have here, uh, should be such that, um, ah, no, I realized what I did wrong. Yeah, we should always correlate one from here from with one from here. Okay, now, now it's better. Okay. Uh, okay. It's now co correct. Yeah. yeah. Well, we we will get it, and and, and uh, in the process we'll uh, realize what is important. <laughs> now, what is important here is that. Uh, um, okay. Now we have the correct version. Okay. So now notice that if b is equal to b prime, this is two, but if. Um, but this is this is uh, zero. Okay, so the maximum value of c uh, is less than two. Okay. Now what's important here is that uh, the values of b and b prime do not depend on the values of a, right? So what, so if uh, 
whether, whether we measured A or we measured A prime, we had initially the same values for B and B prime, right? That's, they were determined by the local hidden variables here, and they didn't depend on which choice we make here to measure A or A prime. So that's why we could say that if this one is non-zero, that one is zero, right? Because they are really a different correlator with different A's. So that's classical. And then we could derive uh, the quantum mechanical bound, which comes from, uh, let's say, computing C squared. And if you compute the square of C, then uh, we just take the square. So we take the square of each of these. So let's do this in the quantum theory, where these are non-commuting operators. So there are a bunch of terms which are the square of each of them. And A and B commute. And so the, the operators on the left and operators on the right, they all commute with each other. So the squares of all of these are all 1. And so we get a factor of 4, because we had 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1. And then we have all the products of the various ones. And that gives, uh, well, a bunch of terms. Um, and this bunch of terms can be uh, rearranged into the commutator of A with A prime and commutator with B with B prime. And if you've never done it, just do it, because it's kind of fun. Um, and so in thi this way, you see uh, the new feature of the quantum theory, which uh, is that there could be here a non-trivial commutator. Now, how big can this commutator be? Well, we can. Um, if I mean, something that has eigenvalues plus or minus 1 are the sigma matrices, Pauli sigma matrices, right? And we know that uh, if we choose, for example, this to be x and this to be y, then the commutator of x and y is sigma c. And we can have here another sigma c, the tilde, different sigma matrix. Um, actually, 2. Uh, yeah. And so now uh, we get the factor of uh, 4 plus 4, right? And that's the square root of 2 that we uh, discussed before. So the C maximum in the quantum theory could be 2 times square root of 2. And it could be this value because we can find an eigenstate uh, of the system that has this value and so um, OK, very good. So that's uh, the usual story. Now, an important feature of this story is the ability of measuring, of, of being able to measure here, two operators that do not commute with each other. Okay. <coughs> That's the standard story. Now, <coughs> let's go back to cosmology. What, what do we measure? So we measure uh, basically the fluctuation, cos cosmic fluctuations of the scale factor, sigma, uh, phi, right, of the, the field position phi. Now, there is an unfortunate fact, which is the fact that uh, phi is just like a position. And so <coughs> it commutes with itself everywhere. Right? So, uh, so we cannot do anything. So by measuring phi, so if we measure phi here and measure phi here, we won't get uh, anywhere. <coughs> so we, in principle, would have to measure phi here and the moment, the conjugate momentum, p phi. Right? But p phi is an inaccessible uh, quantity in, uh, in cosmology. So, so we are out of luck and we cannot do it. Okay? So from this point of view, it looks like it cannot be done. Um, however, um, in any experiment, including the Bell experiment, I mean, when you really <coughs> actually do the measurement, you are some observer. Let's say this is time going forward. So the measurements are done here. And the measurements are relayed to the observer, right? And by the time they are relayed to the observer, whatever is relayed to the observer is, of <coughs> course, uh, commuting observables. So this guy is only going to be able to measure commuting things. So this feature of Bell, that you measure non-commuting things and then you are surprised, comes from putting the transition between classical and quantum roughly some time where these two are causally disconnected. And only there you can uh, really find the problem. That's why people who try to make uh, microscopic models of quantum mechanics like Toft and company, they say, well, the way to evade this is that, well, the, um, you cannot put the transition between classical and quantum here. You have to see what the observer actually sees here. And well, you cannot formulate the paradox, uh, uh, the Bell paradox, uh, if you just only look at the observers observations this guy is making, which are all commuting. Um, OK, so then going back to cosmology, then now we have another possible idea, which is to say that we can uh, put the transition between classical and quantum. <coughs> the idea is to just somehow put it earlier. Right? What does it mean to put it earlier? What it means is to interpret the results that we're getting here as coming from some time evolution. And some time evolution where different features are created at different times, right? So that if we look in the sky and 
we find uh, a feature at the given uh, length scale, we're going to think that that's a feature that was created earlier than a feature that uh, appears at the shorter length scale. Right? So we, we have this translation between length scale and, um, and time during inflation, which uh, sort of this idea of having the sitter space gives us. And that's some interpretation. That's some interpretation of the, of the data we have at late times. In the same way that uh, here, when the observer receives this signal, he has the interpretation, or she has the interpretation, that it comes from measurements that these people made here earlier, right? And not that they were created just a moment before, right? So we can make uh, this, extra, uh, this extra assumption, which in some sense it, we always make when we make this uh, Bell inequality. Description, of course, is very, very reasonable in this case. In this case, it's also somewhat reasonable, but it will allow us to uh, discuss a little something. Well, you could say, uh, to justify this, that you, you look at the perturbation when it takes to the zero time. Yes, 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 yes. That's equivalent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we, we are going to look at something. So we let's imagine that. Uh, so the basic idea is to consider, for example, the creation of. <coughs> now, Inflation is creating these entangled pairs all the time. But the problem is normally for ordinary particles, it creates entangled pairs. But then they become very classical. And they become very classical, and we cannot really measure them. So uh, the, the idea is you can create the entangled pair and measure them while they are still quantum. Okay, That's one approach. And now a, a good thing to, to measure this way is if you had a massive particle, and let's say it had some isospin, so some isospin s, isos isospin degrees of freedom. Then you create the massive particle, and the isospin degrees of freedom, they don't become more classical as the universe expands. So these two will get separated, and the isospin degrees of freedom remain quantum and remain entangled. Okay? Then you can have a chance to uh, do uh, some measurement. <coughs> now, I, I would love to find the. It could o be ordinary spin. Yeah, I, I, I'll, I, you'll see in a second why I want it to be ordinary spin. Um, yeah, I want it to be is we want it to be isospin because we at some point this particle will decay, right? Um, but we want it we want it to be somehow measured, similar to how the spins are measured here, right? So the we want to say that the decay will measure the, sp the isospin. And Yes, but w one, one second. But we, yeah, yeah, now we, we can pr probably do it with spin, but it's a little simpler to, to do it with ISO spin. So, because we want to be able to measure the spin in different directions, right? So we need to generate uh, deep projections along different directions. How we will do that? So we'll do that by saying that there is, uh, let's say, an ISO spin triplet field. Um, so there is some. Um, some isos some massless a set of massless fields that themselves have quantum fluctuations and they will be have some quantum fluctuations that will make them different uh, in different regions so here we'll have some direction of this isospin field uh, and it has a different direction in this region right um, and um, and then uh, the idea is that if uh, now the, the, decay, the decay of this particle will proceed differently depending on whether the spin is along this direction or in the opposite direction. Okay? So, uh, so prof proceed differently means that it creates, uh, let's say in one case it creates three particles, in the other case it creates five particles, and it creates a big enough perturbation that is a locally big deviation from the Gaussian fluctuation. So we have the Gaussian fluctuations, and uh, we create uh, big enough perturbation on the Gaussian fluctuations so as to, uh, so that we can recognize it uh, in, in the sky directly. So the idea is that we will have um, the massive particles will correspond to, well, after they decay, they will have the usual Gaussian fields, and there will be some non-Gaussianity uh, confined within some region. There will be, that's the decay of one of the particles. There will be perhaps a different pattern of non-Gaussianity here in the different region. This is uh, let's say black or white or spin up or spin down. Um, but these are spin up or spin down in the directions of the isospin. So we'd also like to be able to measure the isospin direction in these this fields. 
So we are going to postulate that this, uh, this is a massless field which remains all the way to the end of inflation and today. Okay, so I'm postulating this is not actual model of inflation, but some other model where this uh, isospin field is remaining all the, all, the, all the way to today. And in that case, we, in the sky, we can measure this isospin direction. Um, <coughs> and then from the isospin direction, we know that here we measured along this direction, and here we measured along that direction. Of course, this, although all those things are random, so there will be another place in the sky where um, there will be both of the same type, and the isospin directions will be uh, different. So, okay. And then um, we can form, so we, by looking at all these pairs, we can actually form this uh, correlator. So we'll uh, select uh, in all these pairs all the cases where the isospin directions are along A and A prime and B and B prime. This will be a subset of all the pairs. And with all these pairs, we can, in principle, uh, test the Bell inequality. So this, I'm not saying this is a realistic scenario. This is, this is a proof of principle that, at least in a sufficiently strange inflationary scenario, we could have a test of Bell inequalities. Okay? So now, an exercise, uh, for an exercise is to find the test of Bell inequalities in the actual, in a simpler in a simpler inflationary scenario, like a single field and perhaps gravity, using gravity and uh, the graviton and the scalar. It, we, we, tried, uh, we tried doing this uh, without success. And um, I, maybe I shouldn't tell you why we failed, but <laughs> 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 because maybe we won't fail by thinking about it more <laughs> cleverly. Um, and, uh, but, uh, well, some of the difficulties is this fact that we discussed that the fluctuations, once they are created, they become uh, classical um, uh, relatively quickly. Here, this isospin does not become classical. The second difficulty is that the Bell discussion involves making a measurement. Now, what is a measurement, if you think about a measurement? Measurement is that you uh, created a big departure from the vacuum uh, where you got a really clear yes or no answer. Okay? Now, most of the non-Gaussianities we discuss in single field model and so on are very, very tiny and are only present statistically. So we cannot look at the region of the sky and say, oh, here the non-Gaussianity is big. We can look at the whole sky, make a Fourier transform, etc., see a tiny deviation from non-Gaussian. It's more like an interference effect. So what we are able to see is uh, with these non-Gaussianities, we can do something of this in this period. But it's not a Bell inequality, it's more like an interference effect. It's, it's roughly like the young uh, double slit <laughs> experiment. So you have. Still it's a proof of quantum mechanics. It is, it is. These other things are also, yeah, I haven't discussed them. Maybe Nima will discuss them. Um, or you can ask them to ask him to discuss them. Um, so by, so may, maybe I could discuss a little bit now. Uh, so. So it is. While this, the whole details of this scenario are somewhat crazy and probably not, not, not what we have in nature, it, it is not crazy to think that there could, be, uh, there could be other particles during inflation. There could be other massive particles during inflation or with masses comparable to Hubble. And it's also not uh, totally crazy to think, it's, it's a little more, but not uh, completely, to think that those, uh, some of those particles could have spin, could, could have non-zero spin. In a situation like that, these particles will be created, and then the particles could decay to ordinary inflatons. Okay? So this is uh, a possible diagram. And this will give a, a non-Gaussianity. This will give a correction to the four-point function that, uh, unfortunately, is too small to be detected if you assume reasonable couplings here. On the other hand, you could also uh, think of this as one of the background uh, let's say phi dot fields, inflatons, zeta dot. Or, sorry. This is just the, the derivative of the background uh, field. So that really is a three-point function. And then in this three-point function, you can, uh, you can get some signal for this three-point function from this, uh, from this process. And this signal contains some information about the spin. So here, uh, there is an orientation. So there are these two points. So let's say this is the sky. And there are these, uh, well, we can Fourier transform each of these, and then there are two momenta, k1 of this excitation, uh, k2 
of this excitation which is almost equal to k1 and k3 of uh, this guy, we can choose this kinematic configuration where k3 is much smaller than k1 and k2. Um, well, maybe it's better to draw it this way. k1, k2, and k3. And there is a, the spin translates into a non-trivial dependence on this angle, some cosine, some Legendre polynomials, and so on, in terms of this angle, which come from the correlations, so uh, from the quantum correlations between the spin. So in that sense, uh, you, have, um, you have this. And now even without the spin, so already there is some interesting effect even with spin zero particles. There are some uh, oscillations in the... In this regime, the three-point function behaves like uh, k3, so the long one divided by the, uh, the so the, the short the, the long the long mode or small momentum uh, divided by the short the small mode or long mom uh, large momentum to some uh, powers which uh, have to do with the mass of the particle, so mass in units of h, roughly speaking, um, and uh, so you have terms like this, and then you have the complex conjugate. So you have these oscillations as a function of the ratio of the momentum. And again, these oscillations represent an interference between the process where you create the particle with the process where you don't create the particle. And it has some phase information, so you can actually even calculate the phase. Um, and so it's an oscillation phenomenon typical of the, you know, it's, it's really quantum mechanical. I, I'm not sure if you could reproduce this from other I mean, but people have discussed uh, other oscillatory phenomena in uh, inflation coming from oscillators, oscillations in the potential, but uh, those oscillations um, are functions of time, functions of when the oscillation happens. Here, this is a function just purely of the ratio between the two things. It's more has a different uh, time dependence, if you wish, uh, or scale factor dependence. Okay, so these are uh, simpler ways in which you could try to test the the quantum nature in which you could get signals. I mean, more, more interesting that perhaps that is testing the quantum nature is already say, seeing these particles, seeing that you had these particles during... Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Also, yeah, it would be interesting to detect the non-Gaussian. <laughs> I, I, I should mention that uh, with realistic values of these couplings, so which is of the order Planck suppressed couplings, um, the size of this is suppressed relative to the standard, let's say, non-Gaussianity. So the standard non-Gaussianity is the same thing, but with the graviton exchange um, by uh, this extra factor. So it's, m it's, it's smaller. And there is, if it is a massive particle, you also have a Boltzmann suppression factor. So you cannot take the mass much bigger than Hubble. Um, but um, yeah, so hopefully, well, and, and the ordinary non-Gaussianity <coughs> is hard to measure with the CMB. And uh, so it would have to be measured by uh, something that has more statistics, uh, that sees more primordial modes. And there is this candidate that everyone is hoping for, which is the 21 centimeter uh, tomography, which is so far a, a dream, but uh, maybe a dream that will come true at some point. Um, okay, so I'll finish here. <laughs>